Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, I just heard they were taking applications for the Moon Mission 2024, and I'm going to take a week off and study CGI in hopes of getting a spot. So, I hope you enjoy this remastered version of Mark Sargent, Flat Earth Clues, Episode 1, The Fake Moon Landings. I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved. Flat Earth Clues Part 1, The Empty Theater. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in, and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. The clue you have to look at is built upon another conspiracy that has been around for decades, namely the space program. Now in true conspiracy theory form, Mark is starting off by first indicating that there is some power that be that has a grand conspiracy they're trying to get over on us. They name that power to be as NASA and those that control it. So now we all have the proper mindset and preparation to listen to his misuse of information and evidence as he tries to get us to wake up as he is awake. Because for every good conspiracy theory, there has to be a hero to blow the whistle. And Mark wants to be that hero so desperately. Most of those watching this are aware of the varying theories revolving around NASA. The Apollo program, the space shuttle, the International Space Station, and so on. The clue itself isn't based on one of these highly debated topics, but the lack of one. More specifically, motion pictures based on actual events. This, like others in the series, is something you can check out for yourself. Everything you need to reference this is online. To begin, think of all the movies involving space travel that you've seen in your lifetime. You'll start with the obvious. Star Wars, Star Trek, Alien, just to name a few. In fact, if you go through your own personal list, you could probably come up with over 100 different off-world movies without breaking much of a sweat. That part is easy. For the second group, try to come up with space movies that aren't fantasy-based. You'll get a list that has Red Planet, Gravity, Mission to Mars, 2001, things like that. These films will usually take on a not-so-distant future theme and where we could be down the road. And it's still a pretty good-sized list. These first two groups of films are encouraged by the authority because they reinforce the globe model through assumption. The entertainment system demands that the globe view and solar system concept is a given. Therefore, the actual world view must also be true. Or to put it another way, if you're using your suspension of disbelief as you watch a movie like, say, Gravity, then subconsciously you're reinforcing the movie right on top of the real world. The more of these movies you watch and enjoy, the more the lines blur between what you want to believe and what you actually know. You know, every now and then I play a little trick on my dog. I pretend to throw him a ball and he goes running off after it. This is because he does not have the intellectual capacity to do research. And by research, I mean look in my hand to see if I'm actually holding a ball. So he ends up falling for the same trick 10, 15, 20 times in a row. Then he finally gets pissed and starts humping my leg. Well, after reviewing many Flat Earth videos and arguments, I do think that some in the community are at this level of intellect. I believe that Mark thinks you all are. The reason being is he is here rehashing almost word for word the same silliness that Eric Dubé has been spouting about the space program for years, in which now he seems to be passing off as his own grand and independent idea, and he expects you to lap it right up with a sense of wonderment like this little girl. But he has a get out of jail free card, so to say. He told you to do your own research. So now if you cannot distinguish between the fantasy of movies and the reality of the world, it's on you. Watch enough movies about Mars, and you will be less astonished when NASA announces an actual mission to Mars. Same with the Moon, other solar systems, and so on. Releasing the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey in 1968, right before the actual Moon missions, was no accident. 
it took the greatest director of all time five years to make, and several people who saw the theater screenings claimed that many military groups were listed in the credits, only to be removed years later. Now Mark is introducing a sinister level to this. Apparently, there were unnamed, quote-unquote, military groups listed in the original credits to 2001 A Space Odyssey. But simply listing these miscreants publicly in the credits of a movie would blow the conspiracy. So, of course, that could not stand. They had to be removed. Now, mind you, he doesn't present any evidence of this. But he makes the statement. Here's another imaginary ball for you to go chase. But 2001 is just a side note of this clue. For those who really want to dig into Stanley Kubrick's hidden vision, I highly recommend the documentary Room 237. A link to it is below as well. Now mind you, Room 237 was an analysis of the movie The Shining as a metaphor for the extermination of the Native Americans in North America. And the people that were involved in making the movie and the author, Stephen King himself, thought the stretch was a little much. But there's another ball for you to go chase. Now you are aware of the first two groups of space films. There are those that contain generous amounts of fantasy and those who try to paint our near future. These two groups are easy to find. The third group is a challenge. And again, that's where things get interesting. The moon missions concluded in 1972. And even though it's still considered the greatest achievement by mankind, no fact-based movies were made regarding it until The Right Stuff was released in 1983. Now you might say that it had only been 11 years, and maybe it was tough to get the rights, and so on. But that's not what made the film interesting. The movie ran extremely long for 1983, coming in at 3 hours and 12 minutes. It was an exhaustive look at the astronaut selection process, the competition, and the training facility itself. But when the credits rolled three hours later, chronologically, they had only gotten to the low Earth orbit missions. Just for fun, Google the Right Stuff movie and see how many spacecraft you can find. Hey, I've got a better idea. Just for fun, why don't you contemplate why it wasn't called the right equipment? In addition to not having many spacecraft, there weren't many airplanes in it. You know what was in the right stuff? The story of the Mercury 7 and their wives, as well as the interaction between the scientists and the astronauts and the administration, all in the setting of the Cold War-based space race. Before you start quoting movies, you might want to watch them, Mark. It won four Academy Awards and did a great job at the box office, but the Apollo missions were never touched. The only other major motion picture that involved the actual moon program was Apollo 13 in 1995. A full 12 years later, Apollo 13 only covered a single moon orbit and no landing or close-up reference to the previous missions below them. And after 1995, that was it. Nothing. Hollywood is known for leaving no stone unturned, with reboots and sequels to nearly everything. Yet in almost 60 years, there has never been a single moon mission movie based on actual events. Hundreds of science fiction films reference in it. Everything from Superman to the Transformers. But literally nothing that covers the moon's surface. Six complete moon missions involving multiple vehicles, moon buggies, playing golf, and no one wants to touch it. Now, to be fair, there was a TV miniseries in 1998 covering the subject. It was produced by Tom Hanks, who got involved after starring in Apollo 13. There has been no professional production of any kind since then. Again, just for fun, Google From Earth to the Moon TV series and see what you find. The why is easy, and the clue revealed. If Hollywood makes a movie about the moon landings, and it's indistinguishable from the real thing, then how do you know which is real? It raises some subtle questions involving stage technique and how long they've been in place. If Hollywood could fake it now, then when did they first have the ability? There is one other movie which stands out, and I mention it because I can't believe it ever got made, is Capricorn 1. The film's plot involved the faking of a Mars mission and how it could be accomplished. In short, 
It's part of the Conspiracy World Bible. I highly recommend it, and the link is below. To summarize, all space movies are encouraged by the authority, except for the ones that are based on actual accounts. Those are not allowed. The Moon program has been buried in entertainment because the Moon cannot be reached. It's either outside the barrier or just a highly rendered image, like any planet you see when entering a video game. The world is flat, and this is just one clue. So do some of your own research and ask questions. Well, I think that's a sterling idea, Mark. Let's open up Google and do a little research. We might come up with these photographs. This is from a satellite in low lunar orbit, and it's a photograph of the Apollo 11 landing site. You can see the descent module right there in the middle. You can see the laser reflector and some other features. You might even be able to see some footprints if you look closely enough. Here is Apollo 12 and Surveyor. You can clearly see footprints in this one, and you can make out quite a few details, including the descent module again. Now, as you correctly pointed out, the Apollo 13 movie did not involve a lunar landing. That's because they had a little problem on the way to the moon. They did an orbit, returned, and barely made it back alive. Again, had you watched the actual movie, you would have known that it was not about a moon landing. It was about their struggle for survival. Here is the landing site for Apollo 15. As you can see, there are clearly footprints visible in the dust. You can see some of the equipment that they used. You can see the descent stage as well. As a matter of fact, on the right side of the photograph, I think you can see the lunar rover. Here is Apollo 16, right where it's supposed to be. You can see the descent module. You can see the lunar rover and some of the equipment that they set up. Now, this one's kind of special to me. This is Apollo 17. The reason it's special is that I was living in Florida at the time, and I actually watched this mission go up. It was a spectacular night watch, something that I will remember for the rest of my life. This is as good a time as any to end up this review of part one of Flat Earth Clues. What we've seen so far is that Mark Sargent is basically rehashing the exact same argument seen on every single Flat Earth site that I have reviewed, which goes all the way back to the granddaddy of them all, Eric Dubay almost word for word. Not only is there no new information with this video, every word of it is the same silly, illogical, and non-factual information that has been repeated again and again and again. Throughout the video, I put up nearly a dozen movies that were made concerning the Apollo program. Did Mark not properly research this video before putting out this nonsense that was so easily disproven in five minutes on Google? Or did he put it out telling you to do your own research and knowing that you wouldn't because you have yet another imaginary ball to chase now? Now tomorrow I'm going to review part two, so please like and subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss anything that we put out. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan.